I chair the big data and analytics board for AT&T, uh, among some other companies. So the data I'm going to show you here, though, is data that comes from normal operations. This happens to be credit card data from a mid-tier uh, economy, sort of average GDP is around uh, $2,500 per person. And what it shows you is a pattern that we've seen in every part of the world. So this is uh, the monthly pattern of a person. So if a circle is bigger, that means it's a place that they go to more often. Uh, the arrows, if they're thicker, that means they go from this place to that place quite frequently. And what you see is two distinct regimes. You see the daily habits, which are extremely predictable uh, for people. Um, and those are those big circles in the middle. And then you see things that are extremely unpredictable by any of the methods that we've been able to look at. And what happens is people do these very uh, predictable behaviors most of the time. And every once in a while, they break free and do this other stuff, which I'm calling exploration. Now, what's interesting about this is that this is the same behavior you see in most animal species uh, uh, above uh, most, uh, most mammals. It's sort of hard to say exactly where in the phylogenetic scale it, it varies. But you can imagine an animal going to a berry bush regularly every morning, getting some berries, coming back. And what you see is you see them also exploring just in case that berry bush goes away, right? So it's actually behavior that is not immediately economic. It's behavior where they're storing up opportunities that they could potentially exploit for the future. And in fact, this is what you see in people's data, too. They don't typically change their behavior as a function of the exploration unless something happens. Well, what could happen? Well, you could lose your job. You could get sick. And in fact, what happens when, that ha uh, when something stressful happens to you is you change your ratio of exploration to habits. And in extreme cases, your habits begin to decay. And in comparing that signal for stress to what banks do for financial stress, we can beat the banks by more than 50%. So this is individual behavior. We can see when people are falling apart. We've also shown that you can do the same thing for physical disease and mental disease. They're slightly different patterns. Uh, as the chief technical officer of the US said, this could save our health system. And what he meant was is if you can see people getting sick, getting stressed before they get seriously ill or really in trouble, then you can intervene. Much cheaper, much more humane. So that's not something that you'll usually think about people as being foraging. We think of ourselves as very rational. But here's this very ancient biological behavior. When you put that together in groups, and this is telco data, um, what you find is people cluster together. Their exploration is not individually predictable, but they form into subsets of people, tribes, if you were, um, that have very similar behavior. So if you're a member of a group, you will go to certain locations and not others. So what this is is people find that they like certain restaurants, they like certain music, and they go to things like that. And what happens is lots of other people do, not people they know, just people that are sort of making the same choices as they do. And if you look at these people, you find they have enormously similar characteristics in terms of purchasing behavior, in terms of financial behavior, and in terms of chronic diseases, diseases that are the, the function of that behavior. Um, and so it's really interesting to see that if you, for instance, and this again is in a, a sort of a mid-tier developing country, if you look at these patterns of physical association, um, and you call those social bridges, what you find is, is that you can predict a very wide range of behaviors more than three times better than you can with the best socioeconomic information that they have available. So gender, marital status, education, working style, income, all those other sorts of things only give you a third the power of association. So what's happening? I'll go back to the, the monkeys in the trees. Well, what's happening here is people are learning from each other. They're picking up new cultural patterns. They're finding ways to behave. And that evolves separately in these groups that are heavily exposed to each other. 
So it's like moving the brains here, except you don't actually have to talk to the person. You have to see that they're wearing the new boots, and that looks good, and everybody else likes it, so I'm going to get those too. But it's amazing that across a city of several million people, you can beat demographics by a factor of three. What that means is if I wanted to, for instance, change behavior by launching a campaign of some sort, I should be using patterns of association, not demographics. Nobody does that in the world today. If I want to stop diabetes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find patterns of behavior, con tribes, communities, that have high incidence of this. And it's not their socioeconomic status. It's not their demographics. It's that they hang out together and they learn habits from each other. Much more powerful way to look at it. Indeed, if you look at these sorts of things, you can predict which neighborhoods are healthy and which neighborhoods are not healthy in certain technical senses, just like I could do with individuals. If they have sufficient mixing, sufficient mixing of ideas, learning, they develop a culture. And if that culture develops quickly, and adapts to the environment, it will be a healthy culture. You can turn that around, which is really interesting. So I talked about people going to different places. You can do this with credit card data. You can do it with teleco data. You can even do it with transportation data, if it's got the right sort of transportation systems. Uh, but I can also ask, well, what about instead of network of people going places, how about if I look at the places and ask about the people going through them? Because if you remember back here, the green dot people all went to the same places. It turns out that when, and the blue dot to the blue, and so on and so forth, if you actually evaluate those things, oops, you find that you could predict the, uh, the financial prosperity and the regularity of these small businesses. So let me say that again. If you are part of a network of stores, which means you share customers with other stores, you have most of the same properties as those other stores with respect to income and financial viability. And what that does is that gives you a way to do credit scoring for small businesses. And that matters, of course, because small businesses are the major source of employment in most economies. And currently, there's no way to get them involved in taking loans, being part of a more sort of formal, highly leveraged economy. This gives you, for the first time that I've heard of, a way to actually score SMEs that works like gangbusters. <laughs> so this is the sort of big data that you're talking about. So it's just what you were talking about earlier, but now brought down to the individual, to the store, and so forth. And all the things that I've shown you here, except for the individual health, were anonymous, quote unquote, data. So one of the questions that we work on a lot, and maybe we'll have conversation on the uh, panel, because I know we're all concerned about this, is how do we make this data, which is private data, it's owned by the banks, by the telcos, by others, available to civil society so that we can harvest some of this public good. And what we have to do is do that in a way that doesn't endanger the individuals or the companies and their commercial advantage. And so over the last several years, we've worked with Orange, with Tele uh, Telefonica, with AT&T, to develop infrastructure that lets you do this. And we've deployed it in places like Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, and we're doing it now in Andorra uh, and in Bogota to find a way to take this proprietary data, aggregate it to the minimum necessary to do these sorts of public good things, and make it available as open data. And for the companies, um, this is a way to legitimize their use of data in society. For society, it's a way to have access to these new ways of understanding ourselves and doing development. 